So, uh, <laughs> ZPAC, you are uh, catching us mid start of a podcast. We're doing a different thing today. We are doing a video and audio podcast at the same time. Hence, these penises in our face. Robot, robot penises. Yeah. Robotic. Yeah. Electronic penises. This is why people come to this podcast for these kinds of metaphors and it's analogies. True. It's true. <laughs> and uh, so for people who are listening just on the podcast, we're trying to expand the podcast, make it more comprehensible instead of just porting over videos like we normally do. And that means that I got to get my shit out of the way real fast here, which is we love you guys. Do us a favor. Open up the podcast app if you're an Apple person. Search for Incident Report. Pull it up. Scroll down to where the reviews are. Click Write a Review. Give us some stars because it helps a lot. For some reason, all the podcast people love it when you leave reviews, and it bumps us up the charts, which makes us dope. So we can give you know people like the curbsiders a run for their money. Joe Rogan, he's going down because he's clearly just science and medicine, just like us. And <laughs> bro, also, bro, science, bro, science, bro, science. Bro yeah. science. I, by the way, I got brokitis over the uh, holidays. I heard, a, yeah, yeah. yeah man the anti-vaxxers uh, said it was because you uh, <laughs> <laughs> your cold morphed into the flu. Oh my god! I didn't understand you know, the jokes. <laughs> you know, this is the thing we, we were talking about this before. Let me let me get one other thing out for the podcast people, real quick. Go to facebook.com forward slash become supporter forward slash zdogmd, and for four ninety nine a month, you can help support the show, get exclusive live content, and soon CME and CEU credits for things that we do. All right, now back to anti vaxxers and how freaking dumb they are. So. I did a show on man flu over the holiday, and because I had a cold, and it turned into man flu, meaning I was complaining a lot. Yeah, and my wife commented that I must have man flu. Because no, it's, it's a real thing. thing. It's a, a real thing. thing. Man flu. The is women real. don't understand the pain that we go through. Hemfluenza. Yeah, and bronchitis. Mm-hmm. I had all those things. I had Ebola, and I, I, I did a post about it. The anti-vaxxers on Stop Mandatory Vaccinations, which is apparently a Facebook, private Facebook group, which oh, you can God. get banned for by being a part of any real science group. <laughs> if they see that you're in a science group, they ban you. The moderators ban you from their group because they're like, you don't have no place here. Science. And so they took what I said about man flu. I said, my cold morphed into man flu. And they said, they made a stupid meme, which by the way, they're really bad at making memes. Like really bad. They're like, terrible. Yeah. We need to send them back to meme camp. hmm like, you know how they had space camp? Yeah. They ought to have meme camp. Meme camp. <laughs> Equally useless for, you know, people who are just out to lunch. So, so these guys wrote, see, Z-Dog got the flu shot. He got the flu. So therefore, flu shot doesn't work. They confused my joke about man flu with this. So, so what we realized is, first of all, they're dumb. Mm-hmm. Second of all, they're concrete thinkers. Exactly. It, explain, because you were explaining it to me. So, well... You know those Dairy Queen, the concretes that they have there? Yes. It's like that. <laughs> but for thinking. <laughs> Thank you, Tom Heinover. You're adding uh, tremendous amounts of intellectual value to this discussion. No, just, they, they have no ability to think abstractly. So like when they read the insert, they're like, you know, oh, it says there's mercury in here. That mercury is bad. They don't realize that dose makes the poison and that, you know, there's probably like trace amounts of mercury or whatever because they can't think abstractly you know what i think and how can you operate the modern world when you can't think abstractly you know what i mean you know it's fascinating because you said this to me this morning and it never had occurred to me that they just lack abstract thinking skills yeah. anti-vaxxers i uh, know 100 percent. and you're absolutely spot on because they are so concrete that when you argue with them it's like literally arguing with a concrete wall well it's like remember they show okay they showed up and they banged on the glass behind you when you were interviewing paul offit who was sitting in my seat now and they had a picture of their dead daughter, which we, or one of them had a picture of his daughter who had died from suds, he said. And we can't see it through the blinds back here. Like when you look at Z's shot, it's hard to see through that at night. Right. Right. So we just saw crazy. Yeah. So when yeah. you go on the anti vax pages, they're basically saying, oh, Z Dog laughs at dead child. It's right. like, well, no, we're laughing that you're like even here, yeah. that you're interrupting our shit. And that you, you know what I mean? Like, and that it was so predictable that Paul Offit comes on the show. They find us and they try to disrupt it. And they're banging that's what, on the glass and because call, they're calling concrete. you Z knob. Like, that's funny. They're it's funny to us. It's yeah. funny to us. Now, the thing is, so we didn't realize, you know, oh, he lost a daughter. Now, again, there's no real evidence that it was from vaccines, but that's irrelevant. He lost a child. That right. is something to, you don't make fun of that. And I never have. The other thing that the concrete- They think you have, though. No, they think I have. They're yeah, such concrete Because they're thinkers. concrete thinkers. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing that they've done that's concrete is you and I were uh, shooting a flu vaccination video where we got our flu shots at UMC Hospital. And I made a joke about you. You were about to get your injection. And I said, now, okay, Tom, are you prepared to become autistic? <laughs> and that 
they, in their concrete thinking, said Z Dog MD makes fun of autistic children. Now, of course, not at all. First of all, I'm making fun of you. Second of right. all, I'm making fun of them. But they don't have enough abstraction to be able to see that. And what's fascinating is they also don't have the abstraction to realize that when they say that they would rather see a child die of a preventable illness, measles, mumps, rubella, whooping cough, pertussis, et cetera, than be autistic, that that's more horrible to people with intellectual disabilities or autism uh, than any joke that I've ever made, which has nothing to do with those with disabilities. Right. They, they can't see it. So anyways, <clears throat> well, no, screw I, them all. It is interesting because, you know, there was, um, I think I think there was a like a survey like 130 years ago or something, you know, and they asked people, um, what's the difference or what's the, what are the similarities between a crow and a fish? And, you know, normal people back then would be like, there are no similarities. They're, one's a crow and one's a fish. What are you talking about, right? Right. So they couldn't think abstractly to be like, they're both animals. They, they couldn't even get that far, you know, and we've seen that as IQ has, has risen, people have been able to think more abstractly. So not being able to think abstract is basically a sign of low IQ. You know, and, and I think even IQ is a, it's a, because it's one measure, but I'd say being unable to abstract is a sign of not being an adult. So yeah. children don't abstract very well. Children are concrete thinkers. They're concrete thinkers. They have no Piaget stages of development. Exactly. Right. They have no theory of mind. They think that what they think is what you know and that we're all thinking the same thing, right? It's great. why you can't follow their story. It's a great example. Concrete thinker sees a bunch of needles stuck in a baby and goes, oh, that's terrible. You're toxifying that baby with poison. Right. Whereas any normal grown-up with abstract thinking skills and maybe a basic biological education would say... No, actually, there's there's more nuance to this. Yeah. These are antigens, which are actually fewer in number than they were in the old days, even though there's more injections because more vaccines, because science. <laughs> uh, and it induces an immune response that then helps protect us against future infection. Right. They are uh, uh, associated in very rare instances with some adverse effects. Most of them are like red skin, soreness in the muscle, low-grade fever. But in very rare instances, they can cause you know other uh, uh, more difficult side effects. But the risk of those side effects is so small that you would not not wear a seatbelt because there's a small risk of you being decapitated by the seatbelt in an abnormal type of collision. You'd still wear your belt because on average, it's going to keep you alive, and it has. We've seen that. And yeah. same thing with vaccines. One of the great public health triumphs. So. You know now people say and and like to be fair like we have said that we're not going to talk about anti-vaxxers i think what we meant though is we're not going to allow them to propagate their nonsense right. on our pages it doesn't mean we're not going to talk about what's going on because the reason it's important to talk about it is because they're what uh, nasim taleb calls an intransigent or an intolerant minority and people who are you know groups of collectives of intolerant intransigent minorities are the people who actually move the needle on things because they just sit in one spot they're human anchors and they're like no i'm not going to go anywhere now sometimes this can be very positive martin luther king led an intolerant minority right but it can be very negative and have very negative use cases anti-vaccines so interesting because i haven't heard about that intransigent minority and it makes a lot of sense and the idea that they will they will actually not move until damage has been done exactly consistently so th that's my stance is look i'm not against de i'm i'm not for deplatforming people uh, interfering with free speech however my platform is not your free speech you don't get the right to come and comment on my right. shit if you're anti-vax i'll just delete you ban you for good because you are an intransigent i like this now intransigent minority yeah. that is harming people. Or intolerant minority. And and throughout uh, history, you know, like the suffragettes were an intolerant minority, but that has, uh, you know, positive benefits going throughout. Or, you know, and so you can use it, it's a tool and you can use it either direction. But I think it's interesting to note because like, okay, we had uh, your friend Peter Atia on the show recently, who is, you know, one of the smartest people uh, I've ever talked to, you know, ever listened to. And uh, even he said he skipped his two month vaccination schedule to wait until six months. Why? He didn't really know why. He didn't really have an answer. I think it's because he lives in, you know, one of these liberal bastion cities, San Diego, and he's getting bombarded with that message all the time from the intolerant minority. And so even as a very smart thinking, rational person, like, he pushed it off four months just because why not? You know what I mean? But yeah. it's like that four month window could be disastrous for your child. Now, I'm sure Peter did everything to keep his child safe, but I'm saying you're increasing risk when you do that. You're increasing the attack surface. Well, actually, this gets to the point of the delayed vaccination. So people will say, well, what, what, what's the harm? You know, is slow, this is slow vax, is what slow it's vax. called. Slow right, vax, right, 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 right. It's a whole movement. Yeah. Slow vax for 2019. <laughs> the, 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 the thing about this idea is, first of all, there's no evidence 
that it decreases adverse events. Mm -hmm. The premise upon which it is based, there are too many injections, too fast all at once for a young immune system, is flagrantly, in. it's just not correct. Yeah. So we actually have less antigens in these vaccines collectively than we did in the old days, and our own body is exposed to vastly more antigens when we eat a ho-ho. Yeah. Um, so... It, it's based on false stuff. Now, the danger is you open up windows. The reason these schedules exist is because you don't want to uh, expose a child to a vulnerable window where they're in daycare or wherever, and they end up getting exposed to a kid with who hasn't been vaccinated or someone who the vaccine didn't take or they can't be vaccinated or someone comes from abroad who, who uh, wasn't vaccinated or got measles abroad, which it seems to be happening comes to New Jersey and exposes people, you, you you miss that window and then you end up with one of the most communicable diseases of all time, which is measles, is spreading rapidly through this faulty armor and faulty herd immunity, community immunity. So it, there's really not a rationale for delaying. Now, the thing is, if you're dealing with one of these intolerant minorities who's like, listen, I will do it only if I can delay the schedule, then you know what? You By take, way, it's harm you reduction. You shouldn't pluralize it. When you say intolerant minorities, it sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> one of these intolerant minorities. You know, this is going to be one of those situations where I get CK'd by the press, right? Like Z Dog MD uh, referred to minorities as intolerant. I'll be like, well, no. Well, kind of yes, but not the way you think. I mean, that word doesn't mean what you think. Oh, God damn it. We'll put it like this. Okay, I have a six-week-old right now, right? And so we're going to do the big vaccination push in two weeks here. Hmm. And you know, right now, it's like there are days where she's just so fussy, crying, whatever. And, you know, obviously no vaccinations have been given. But if one of those days happened to line up and I correlated it and then later she ended up having a problem, like she was autistic or something. You can't tell now. Like newborns won't even look you in the eye. Yeah. It's hard to tell if anything's going on with them developmentally. Like, right. You know, um, if that correlated, I would immediately think, especially if I was somebody who had no science background, I was a concrete thinker, I'd be like, oh, the be the needle, and then the baby cried, and then and then she was like, oh, and then now. You know what I mean? That's how I would think. <laughs> now, you know, and again, and not to put a, too fine a point on this, the lack of abstract, nuanced thinking, mm -hmm. critical thinking. And, 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 and the thing is, but they'll say, well, no, no, you guys just are, you're the ones who aren't critical thinking because uh, you're just blinded by pharma money, yeah. by greed. Who's paying you to Who's say this? Who's paying you? Who's paying you? Who's paying you? <laughs> Hours of this. That's literally what, because it's concrete. It's like a, a cave person just banging a stick. And here's, yeah. here's the interesting thing. Like they, they will agitate and they will get really mad because what they're not used to are the other side of the equation, like the doctors, like myself, coming back at them with equivalently concrete, just like, you're dumb. <laughs> yeah. No, you're dumb. No, here's the thing. Listen to me carefully. You are dumb. And the thing is, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Joe, Ro Joe Rogan has an amazing bit where he says, uh, all, all you need in order to be king of the dumb people is confidence, right? So it's just mm -hmm. like a bunch of dumb people be like, I don't know what's going on. Do you know what's going on? I don't know what's going on. I'm pretty sure I think I know what's going on. Pretty sure. That's all you need. That's all you need. Just that's con man. You just need confidence. It's kind of the story yeah. of my life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm a con man for higher IQ people. <laughs> right. So all you have to do is be somebody like JB Hanley, who's just like, I'm oh. pretty sure I mm -hmm. think I know what's going on. Or somebody like uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's like, I have a law degree and the name Kennedy after my name. Exactly. Or Wakefield. It's like, who, what have you ever done? The, Nothing. You know what's interesting about Wakefield? He's a high IQ individual Yeah. Uh, who actually is very smart. He's actually openly... See, the thing about him is he's deceptive. So he's actually a true con man in the sense that he's trying to make money on the thing. You know, He was being paid by lawyers at the time of his mm -hmm. now retracted article. He's just a bad, evil person. Yeah. And and again, again, now let me be careful because I'm falling into dichotomous thinking. I'm 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 John Haidt would yell at me for saying that because people aren't black and white. There is no good versus evil. It's everybody thinking they're doing the right thing. He's thinking he's doing the right thing. It just turns out what he's doing is abjectly evil. And, yeah. and his motivations are not you know, he they accuse us of being motivated by money. It's really look at look at the supplement industrial complex, the anti vax industrial right. complex. The you know essential oil industrial complex, no. Hitler, Mao, Stalin—they all think they're doing the right thing. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, we we as humans have to believe that we're right in order to do atrocious things. We have to, I think. Yeah. You know, I, I I don't think I think only psychopaths they don't even know right and wrong. You know, look at this with medicine too. Like all the procedures that that get done that doctors think need to be done, but 
we both know they don't need to be done, mm. right? I mean, there's harm being done in the, and, and this is where the anti-vaxxers are right. There's harm being done in the modern medical system every single day. This is a central premise of what I want to work on in 2019, actually, is this raising this awareness that a lot of what we do is not helpful. Right. You know, when, when we had Robbie Pearl on the show, he talks about this in his book, Mistreated Quite a Bit. You know, now here's the thing. There's a conflict here. And the CEO of the Kaiser Group, right? So it's like, well, yeah, they're always incentivized as a kind of health management entity to do only the minimum necessary to keep patients healthy yeah. because anything else it's coming out of their pockets. But the thing is, in an optimal world where you optimize for that, that means you figure out what works and you ditch what doesn't. It turns out a lot of what we do doesn't work. If anything, part of the reason Kaiser hasn't succeeded more is that they're under pressure from patient expectations because the community does procedures at a certain level. So yeah, you get a knee arthroscopy or yeah, you get an unnecessary spine surgery or yeah, you get whatever. And so now Kaiser gets pressured to do the same things or else those patients are gonna, next year when they re-up with their employer, they're gonna pick the plan that is maybe a little more expensive but allows them to do all this stuff that doesn't necessarily help them but maybe has a strong placebo effect or is just an expectational thing that they want a magical answer to things that are not magical. Yeah. And you know, and this relates to anti-vaxxers in that they pick up on this. In some sense, they're concrete thinkers, but they're actually rather intuitive in the sense that they can smell kind of conflict. And one of the things I think they sense in, and I can't believe I'm defending anti-vaxxers, but I'm gonna do it. What they sense in the medical establishment is a failure to be transparent, a failure to own up to when we do get it wrong, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of conditioning in our own education. And, and this is all true, but it's still, it's the best thing we have. We should get better. I'm here telling people we need to get better as a, as a kind of a, a product of that environment. Yeah. You know? But then you have guys like Andrew Weil say who, yeah, he's a doctor too, but it's hard to know where a guy like that comes from. And he's selling a lot of you know supplements and alternative medicine stuff. But at the same time, a lot of the stuff he says is accurate in terms of the failings of Western medicine. So what we have to do is, again, we have to go beyond our concrete thinking, be able to think nuance and take Jonathan Haidt's advice, which is don't fall into the traps of distorted thinking, right? Uh, including dichotomous thinking. People are either all good or all bad. Negative filtering always seeing the world through a negative lens. You know, mm -hmm. There's a million different distortions that cognitive behavioral therapy and, and meditation and other things will help you transcend. Now, what the problem with the anti-vaxxers is they have a good point in that, no, we don't know everything. Yes, things do have adverse events. Sure, we should talk about that. But when you actually go into the nuance and you look at it and you look at the data and you actually go through everything, you go, yeah, I, it's assured that you should vaccinate your children yeah. as a hedge against all the terrible things. Well, it's, a, it's a classic throw the baby out with the bathwater thing right. because they they have made like sort of an accurate assessment, which is like, there are some real significant problems here and nobody's quite listening to me and nobody, uh, you know, things people are doing things because their incentives are misaligned with my incentives as the patient. So that's all true. And then they throw out one of the best things we do in medicine, which is vaccines. Like that's one of the that's one of the things medicine does really well. Really well. Really well. You you took you picked up on <laughs> one of the things that's working, man. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, it's it's. It, it, I'm in a unique position because I get a ton of messages. Yeah. Like so many messages that I had to create an autoresponder droid in Facebook to to respond and say, look, I'm not being a dick if I don't respond. I read every single message. It's brutal sometimes. But it's so rewarding most of the time because you get a feeling for what's going on in the world of healthcare and the impact we're having and also ideas coming in for shows and things like that. Right. Well, some of the most interesting and rewarding messages I get are from parents who are on the fence about vaccines. And they say, look, I, I know what you're saying. I'm still very scared for these reasons. I've heard this and this. I want what's right for my kid. And you look at that person, you go, this is a good parent trying to be a better parent. And then I will always drop whatever I'm doing and write whatever it takes yeah. to let them know that first of all, I hear that they're trying to do the right thing. So whatever they decide, um, it's coming from a place of they're trying. And then I said, this is what I would do for my children. And this is an answer to your questions. And Yes, the link that you shared with me looks scary, but look at the source. You know, Health Impact News is not a real legitimate right. medical source. And since the birth of the internet, it's very difficult for non-medical people to tease out what's useful and what's not. And, and you know, 
sometimes WebMD is wrong, right? I mean, WebMD is a lot of muggles go, the non-medical people go to WebMD and go, oh, yeah, yeah, oh this has got to be. But it, it, again, it's not a doctor. Right. And it gets things wrong. Well, imagine now you go to Health Impact News or naturalnews.com or one of these anti-vax sort of places. You're going to get a very, it's, it's like you said, it's like the concrete thinker yeah. who says with absolute certainty they know what's correct. Anytime someone says that without a nuance, you sh your your radar should start to trigger. Yeah. Like if you hear a doctor say, no, um, vaccines are 100% safe, nothing bad will happen, right. you must do it. You better go to a different doctor just because their, their communication style is wrong. Yeah. They ought to tell you, look, everything has risks and benefits. Turns out the risks are tiny whiny, benefits are huge for vaccines. So if it were my child, I would do it. Yeah. If, if a doctor told you, look, Tom, let me ask you this question as a patient. If a doctor said, well, here's what I would do for my mom or my dad or my kids, would that be compelling to you or would you be concerned by that? It's hard to put myself in the, the mindset of one of these people. Put it, put it in your mindset. So um, you're trying to make a decision for you. No, in my mindset, it's not compelling because I don't care what you do anecdotally, like with your own family. Right. I only care what consensus is as a whole. Right. So like you as an individual node in the network, like you may be signaling bad information to me. So I only care about consensus, right? And the, the wide scientific consensus is that vaccines are safe and effective. So even if I, I had a, you know, it's like I, I went in and we had a nurse who was like, you know, oh, they say vaccines cause autism. I don't know. And so she's, she's kind of sowing doubt in this. And so I don't care what she says because I know that wider consensus is that vaccines are safe and effective. You mm. know what I mean? Now, what's interesting I is- I wouldn't take it for an individual. Like I wouldn't, yeah, I, I wouldn't allow one individual to sway my opinion. Mm. So you're an- outlier in the sense that you're looking at consensus and science and that kind of thing. Now, imagine you're an anti-vaxxer and you've already made up your mind based on your ideology and your elephant reaction of like, oh, I don't like authority. I don't like violating my body with quote unquote toxins. Right. And I, I believe these people that I resonate with, so, you know, Jenny McCarthy, et cetera, uh, Jim Carrey, whoever the hell it is. Yeah. Um, freaking who's that guy who played the Rob Schneider is Rob Schneider the is carrot. The stapler. Yeah. Rob Schneider Rob is Schneider. a freaking piece of shit. If you're <laughs> listening to Rob Schneider for your vaccine advice, you can go fuck yourself. I like, know. really? Now, Deuce dude, Bigelow, vaccine yeah, jiggle. Come on, dude. Come on. So, uh, <laughs> but this is what, but so they're uh, going to come in with their confirmation bias. And, it, and what I found as a clinician is if I say, listen, we both want to do the right thing for our kids here is my kids getting a flu vaccination. We did it live on Facebook. Right. And you know what? If they're so intransigent uh, that they still don't, they actually think I faked it. And it's fascinating because it, the, the anti-vaxxers will say that. They're like, no, that's impossible. They can't nuance their way into imagining that I would actually inject my children with vaccines. <laughs> yeah, because, this is one of the things they said. They said that you gave your children fake vaccines. Right, yeah. because they know that I'm a shill right. and that I'm only selling this poison to make money, but I would never give it to my own children because I know better. Right. That's insane. They're, oh, by the way, they also, for people who don't know, they said that Z's net worth is uh, three quarters of a billion dollars. Yeah. And I said, I was like, why have I never been invited on your yacht, Z Dog MD? Because yeah, I only invite the cool kids, Tom. <laughs> like, you know, it is true. I will tell you people that Z drives a Camry XLE. That's true. So Hybrid. That's the nice Camry, y'all. Hybrid. Yeah. It has a moonroof. And I upgraded it because at the last minute, I'm like, you know what? I'm rich. I'm going to spend that $2,000 and get that moonroof. <laughs> and it's a write-off. It has faux wood interior, which is nice. You know what? Yeah. I, um, I pronounce it foxwood <laughs> because it's, it feels a little more upscale. Well, you know, all right. So the thing I was saying about consensus, right? Like that just used to be called common sense. You right. Know? It's right. Just, common sense. It's just common sense. Yeah. But you know, we you know, and again, because we're more polarized now, yeah. because we we don't have a common enemy in the form of the Soviet Union anymore, and because the internet has given everybody an equal opportunity to be a dipshit um, to to experts. That there's a death of expertise. All the things that we talk about. The, now, some the, some experts need to die. We've talked about this before. You know, oh I mean? yeah, soft oh. sciences. That we don't need experts in economics or sociology. Or have we talked about that? Yeah, a little bit. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I agree 100. percent Well, so. you're wrong. Argue with me Stop on this. Stop trying to be an why, expert. Why do we not need economists? Because they're all full of shit? Yeah, 100%. Okay. Macroeconomics is mm. nonsense. Ah. Right? Well, you know- Macroeconomics is just you saying, okay, which way is the Fed going to pull the lever on rates? That's not 
that's that's not being an economist. That that's just you speculating on uh, an outcome of a centralized institution. You know, Tom Heinberg, right. I'm going to say something now, and it's coming from a place of deep hurt, and that is that I took AP economics mm-hmm. micro microeconomics. Micro is correct. I got a five out of five on the <laughs> test. Okay, and just for fun, I never took the class, and I, now I'm starting to realize I'm supporting your point here. I never took macroeconomics, never read a page of it, decided I would sit for the AP test, macroeconomics, yeah. thinking, hey, I'm here anyways. I got a five out of five on right. macroeconomics. I was an 18-year-old boy <laughs> growing up in the Central Valley, as good as a macroeconomist, at least as far as the AP test was right. concerned. So maybe you're right. Well, it's a, it's a soft science because, you know, all all – and I don't want to go too deep in the weeds on economics, but like all economics that are taught in schools are Keynesian economics, which is just inflation is good. You know, we should produce more cheap plastic crap and consume and people shouldn't be able to hoard money is what Keynesian economics says. And it's just not true. And it's it's a small speculative bubble that we're seeing. Well, see, now we're dipping into the iceberg that is Tom Heinberg. So the tip is that, and if you actually ask him to elaborate, it'll be a four-hour discourse on why cryptocurrency is going to decentralize power. We're going to remove violence from the implementation of money. It's true. And it all comes out of the Austrian School of Economics. I knew it. Yes. I knew it had so to be with Falco. What, I, what I'm saying, though, is it's, it's not necessarily about economics in particular. This is just an area of interest where I think experts are wrong. People like Paul Krugman or Noriel Rubini. like. They, they go on and pontificate as political pundits and they say we need to raise rates because of X, Y, or Z, but there's no data to support what they're saying. There's just a bunch of statistical models that back the, the structures that be. Same thing with, you look at like sociology departments in college campuses, right? Like um, there, was, there was a group of guys who got all these, you know, papers about the faux penis published and all, these, all this sort of mm, nonsense. Yeah, right. Because all you have to do is talk their language. And Dog to, rape culture. Yeah, exactly. You like, just yeah. have to say white power, white privilege, allyship, whatever the nonsense words of the day are. Intersectionality. Intersectionality. Yes. And then you'll get in and be published as it's, – it's like idea laundering. You'll be published as though you, you're a real entity. So these are soft sciences. Like – you can't, you know, there's a replication crisis in psychology for a reason. You know what I mean? You know what's interesting? So this gets to our own, because we all have our own things, right? Yeah. That's your platform that you're going to stand on is is that economic platform. In other words, that's one of the things where you're like, experts are wrong, and there's a wave of right that's coming that they will never recognize because they're stuck in this old way of thinking. I think in medicine, it's the same thing. I, I actually think there's an old wave that's just absolutely wrong. And the new wave coming up is saying, no, actually, we could uh, focus on disease prevention in a way that actually is story-driven and relationship-driven, but empowered by technology that and then clicks those boxes that we don't need to click and does the population health kind of connecting the dots in the la- larger community. And it's actually human-dependent, but it's also um, impossible without advanced AI and technology. That's that I think is what's coming. And the old school people are like, I give low sartan for high blood pressure because of kidneys. Right. That's going away. But the other, so this is my little piece, right? The people who think about philosophy and consciousness and stuff like that, that's my hobby, my passion outside of work, whatever work is. When I look at reductionists trying to explain consciousness arising from the brain and these experts going, well, there's this thing called integrated information theory that the more complex a system is, then consciousness emerges from that system. Right. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, we call that uh, magic <laughs> where I come from. Uh, whereas, you know, when we had Hoffman on the show, right. this idea that, no, well, what if we just flip that? And you know, conscious is, consciousness is the primary constituent of reality and everything else emerges from it. And you can actually describe it precisely in scientific terms. It's not magical thinking. So I get passionate about that, and I look at the experts and go, "You guys are dumb." So I think, look, you well, have to well, question experts. This gets to the heart of what I think what is going on because, okay, like there is a decentralization movement happening, and this is not about Bitcoin. This is just about the entire internet. The entire internet is decentralizing everything, right? Mm-hmm. And so what you're seeing is a virtual land grab. So the death of experts is part of the virtual land grab. Like, why do we see things like, you know, um, why, why is the transgender thing such a big push in today's current climate? Because on the, on the internet, you can be a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. You can be whoever you want to be. Like, that can be your new identity, right? Mm-hmm. So all the rules are up for grabs. That's why we see postmodernism having a large effect. Mm-hmm. Because the internet is a new frontier. It's a new playground. People like me are concerned about laying down digital property rights. You know what I mean? Mm. Other people are concerned about, you know, uh, free expression and 
you know, gender fluid identity, whatever that means. <laughs> so how does how does net neutrality affect this then? Yeah, that's in, that's interesting. Isn't that a kind it's of dead. centralization? Ajit Pai killed it. <laughs> oh, that guy. <laughs> hey, he's a fellow Indian, okay, buddy? <laughs> don't, don't he had a really him. big mug is what I remember. Ah, about yes, him. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. But, but, you know, this idea of decentralization, meaning the network makes decisions. Yeah. In other words, you have all these little network nodes, human beings, data points, exchanging data freely in a way that what emerges out of that are decisions that uh, are somewhat coordinated by nodes in the network, right. but there's no central government or resource or entity making decisions for people anymore, including in democracy. So right. is this the end of democracy? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I think liberal democracy as a thing has run its course. It was necessary, but the next thing is going to be, yeah. you know, what Yale Hariri would say is a kind of a AI enabled network uh, dataism as a religion, dataism as a moral. So the free flow of data so that decisions can be made based on the absolute availability of data in any, any given second. Yeah. Wh which reminds There's me. sort of been a lid on human expression for the last hundred or so years while everything has been so heavily centralized. Right, that's you know true. I mean? Everybody you... had to play by the same rules and think and act the same way. And mm. so, yeah, we're going to see a lot more free expression. That's going to result in tribalism. Like, it's just going to, it it's bound to it happen. Yeah, and it's bound to continue happening, you know? Yeah, I think, though, I'm an optimist. I think that as we will eventually transcend the tribalism that's resurgent right now, that's really a response to right. the lack of central authority. Because, you know, in the old days in, in the U.S., and I think Haidt and others have talked about this in their work. Uh, the U.S. had a common tribal identity, which was we are not the Soviet Union, or we are the bastion, we're the, you know, Reagan's beacon on the hill, or right. or what was it, light on the hill? Uh, the city on the hill. City on the city hill. On That's the right. Hill. I knew it was something. You goddamn Mongolian! We tear down your shitty wall. <laughs> Every time I think of city, I think of that South Park quote, um, which was very racist yeah. and would never fly today. No, never. Because of our hyper politically correct culture. Mm -hmm. um, even Apu can't get a break. I know. You know what I'm saying? He had to shut down the Quickie Mart. They shut it down. They shut it down. Thank you. Come again. But don't because we're shut down. The Slurpee machine is broken. <laughs> Please come again. Uh, so, <laughs> so in, 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 you know, I think we needed this uh, tribal identity as one. So there was always an American identity and then the sub identities were fine, you know, and they were either uh, suppressed as in African Americans, et cetera, or um, assimilated. It was about assimilation, assimilation. Now there's been a fragmentation where everybody has a voice and they want that voice to be heard. But there are two types of this identity tribalism. There's common humanity tribalism, which is, yeah, we're being discriminated against, not being given opportunities to compete in an equal world in our own you know, competence hierarchy. We, we can't because there are systemic uh, things that keep us from doing that and and, I'm appealing to you, Tom Heineber, as a white male uh, and your common humanity to say, don't you want everyone to have procedural justice to be able to uh, compete? And that's that's what Martin Luther King did. So his right. movement was a common humanity identity politics where it's like, you know, look at it, we're African-American, but we're appealing to the larger society and saying, don't you want to share the same human you know, rights that you have with others? And And it worked. But yeah. now what we're seeing is common enemy identity politics, where it's saying, listen, uh, you know, as a, you know, cis, male, brown, you know, Zoroastrian, uh, I have been systematically oppressed by you, Tom Heineber, and your people. Yeah. The people who hold power, which are white males and because one percent of you guys run everything therefore it is an intentional systematic oppression of me so therefore in the call out culture that currently exists it is noble and moral for me to call you out for your racism if you if louis ck says something inappropriate i have to call him out publicly on twitter and rally my troops and that works in the sense that my crowd will really be energized by that and it'll increase tribalism and will the outcomes be better for the world? No, because what, what often happens is a, a series of mistakes. In identity, common enemy identity politics, first of all, there's a confusion of correlation and causation. Same with the anti-vaxxers. They say, well, there are not enough women in the sciences and math. Therefore, it is white male oppression that is causing this to happen. Right. Now, surely there is a component of discrimination and unconscious bias and so on in hiring women in the mass. But 
could it be there are actually differences in predisposition and desires uh, among the genders? And it seems like data suggests that there are some, but even by talking about that, so yeah, there, there's more men in engineering, but why is that? Is it because women are discriminated against or is it because they're societally encouraged to like have Barbies and, and make homes? Or is it because there is some tendency of women to be more relationship driven, less you know, uh, uh, interested in things and material uh, gadgets, which again, the data seems to show that men are more interested in those things. So even having that conversation would violate the common enemy identity politics. So in other words, uh, feminist groups could attack me for even discussing that because it's a sign of my male privilege to to, to continue the oppressive uh, dominance hierarchy by having that discussion. I think that's really, it's not fair to an intellectual discussion. It doesn't lend itself to progress and it's scientifically wrong. So study the hell out of everything. And I think vaccine guys are the same thing. They correlate, oh, the emergence of autism is often diagnosed around the same time you get vaccines. Well, but that doesn't mean the vaccines cause them. Right. So that's my long answer to, I don't know what we were talking about. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot going, <laughs> right? It's but it's and it's, it's nuanced. It's not concrete. Yeah, and it's all it is all a power grab. Because think about it. Like for instance, the the feminism, uh, you know, argument. It's like, do do you just want to discount, you know, the millions and millions of years of collaboration that men and women had to have to get to this place where we are now? Because it was really hard before it was here. You know what I mean? Like, it's it hasn't just been men oppressing women for millions of years. Like it's been in collaboration because before the pill, women had basically no reproductive choice. So, you know, if you were going to have sex, which you're compelled to have sex because it feels great, mm. right? Mm. <laughs> then you're yeah, going to end up with That's end, your rape culture speaking. <laughs> you're going to end up with a baby and then you're going to have to take care of that baby. And men are ill prepared to take care of a baby. I have a six week old right now. Every time I try and comfort this baby, it's like, hey, what's up, baby? And it's just like, I'm not happy to be in your arms right now. I want mommy back. And I'm like, okay, I love you. Here you go. Let's give her. Well, you know, the, the interesting data is in countries where it is very egalitarian in terms of opportunity, right. where women and men both get pater paternity and maternity leave, et cetera, they, 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 there's more discrepancy in outcome. So yeah. there are yet more men in the sciences and stuff and, and engineering and less women because given openness and ability to do what they choose, uh, the genders may well choose things based on their strengths and, and weaknesses. And it turns out women are really good at relationships. They value those, at least in a stereotypical, not stereotypical, in a aggregate area under the curve. They're always outliers in any group. But if you look at, take personality tests for women and men, they score, women score higher in agreeableness than men. Uh, th there are real differences. Now, again, we can't even have those discussions now like even just this discussion we're having right now, there's a part of me that's uncomfortable. Because no, I'm not. I wish we could go further. But see, you <laughs> exactly. If you and me were talking like we were offline, it would be. Believe me, there would be thousands of people coming after me because that's the climate that we're in right now, and yeah. it's it's absolutely terrible. Now, here, okay, here here's one thing I will say. This will inflame at least five people. The whole Louis C.K. thing that happened uh, over the weekend, where the press picked up that like some leaked audio from a, a stand-up comedy thing that Louis C.K. did about like uh, Parkland shooting survivors, whatever. But one thing that he said in that uh, comedy routine was, who the fuck are these children right. in this call-out culture that are pointing at adults and saying, you, you don't get to say that, that's racist or that's whatever. You don't get to express yourself that way. I know what's right, you need to shut up. And C.K. is like, Fuck you. I'm the grown up here. Right. I have the experience and the wisdom of being alive and having actually made money and having a job and having a wife and having kids and having made mistakes. And you, you fucking little twat, are coming at me and telling me to censor my speech. Fuck you. And honestly, I got so pissed off when I, I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, dude. Because <laughs> I feel that way. Like these kids will will be like, you need to stop, you shut the fuck <laughs> up. If you can't have an open conversation and use some of the curse words and, oh, but you're a doctor and it's unprofessional. No, it's unprofessional not to fucking have this conversation. It's unprofessional to shut other people down. Call out culture is unprofessional, right? Trigger warnings are unprofessional. And I'll tell you why. 
You do not treat PTSD with trigger warnings. You treat PTSD with slow exposure clinical therapy. exposure. Yeah. So by hiding, you're actually prolonging. It's a symptom of the disease, not its cure. Uh, the other day, I think there was a post on Facebook and, and it, you know, it was, a, I think a physician had passed away um, and the person had posted trigger warning. This is about the death of a physician. And I was like, well, first of all, trigger warnings are dumb. But second of all, you just triggered whoever was gonna be triggered by talking about the death of a physician. I mean, that's the trigger. Yeah. So I think what we have to do is first of all, we have to manage our mental health crisis better than we have, which that's a whole nother, we've done shows on that. People say that all the time and like, what's it mean? Uh, what it means what's is- What's it mean? What, because you know what, here's the thing, I'm gonna tell you right up, straight up, I don't care if anybody's mad about this, most of you don't have mental illness. Like you have ordinary misery, which is yeah, what yeah. Sigmund Freud called it. You don't have mental illness. You need to just get your shit together. Well, and-, and You know what I mean? You and I Suck it up, go for a long walk, listen to classical music, stop eating junk food, suck it up. For Fuck. most of you. Fuck yeah. And this is what I think, it's not their fault that they're labeling or that they're getting diagnosis. It's the system that diagnoses them, but it's also, we talked about this in our other podcast, you know, the coddling of the American mind. We are creating an anxious, depressed generation, partially by labeling them anxious and depressed, but partially because we're giving them devices, we're connecting them to social media, we're depriving them of play, we're overscheduling them, we're creating um, yeah. a political polarization that makes an us and them evil and not evil. All and we're and our college campuses are encouraging distorted thinking that a cognitive behavioral therapist would look at and go, "What the hell are we doing to our children?" And then we then we wonder when Louis C.K. has to look at these children and say, "Shut the fuck up," right? right? And and again, here's the thing: in the '60s, kids were standing up to adults and saying, "Hey, don't trust anyone over 30. Fuck you." You know, we're right. Hey, that's great, man. That's the energy of youth. And and you find that those people become progressively more conservative as they get older, oh, yeah. as they start having responsibilities and realizing that life isn't all reducible to a simple black and white ideology. It's much more nuanced. But listen, the way it's gotten now, we've partially created this. Now, one thing I'll say, Tom, to double down on your comment about mental illness is that I don't think we're handling mental illness right at all. Because no. I don't think we even understand. We're reducing it to chemicals. And right. it, it, it is a complex, like if, if, you're, if you're a subscriber like I am, that we're all just mind system interacting with itself, dysfunctional yeah. mind system means a complex nested fractal web of dysfunction that needs talk therapy, it needs behavioral therapy, it needs uh, some degree of mindfulness training, and it needs medication altogether. And who's gonna do that? Who's gonna pay for that? Who's got the time? Who's got the training? Oh, and don't forget, it needs psychedelics occasionally. Because increasing evidence says- Potentially, yeah. Potentially, that those can be transformative in the hands of a therapeutic practitioner. When it's also, you know, it's interesting because people say, um, you know, like take your pills, you know, for, for mental illness. Like if you may, just take your pills and you'll be okay. No, no. Like, it doesn't work like that. Mental illness is for people who have real mental illness. It's so severe that there is no cure, right? And let's just contextualize this. Your mother has severe mental illness. My mother illness. has severe mental illness. She's schizoaffective or bipolar to somewhere and who knows what the diagnosis is, right? But she hears the radio talks to her. So right. she's that mentally ill. Yeah. This is where I come from. So when I look at a bunch of people being like, I'm depressed because they're on a college campus. Some of them are, some of them are clinically depressed. Like that's real, but it's, a very small percentage of people. Well, what I think is very small. By, by destigmatizing somewhat depression, what we find now is there's big long lists of wait lists for college psychologists yeah. to see students because they're all identifying as depressed. Now the problem is there is a kind of distorted thinking, the negative filtering that feeds on itself when you diagnose yourself or are diagnosed with depression, which is now I have this thing, which means my negative feelings from right. the unconscious are acted on with negative thoughts, which then perpetuate the negative feelings, which cause this cognitive triad of misery. I'm worthless, my future is bleak, um, and uh, there's no hope. Have you been depressed? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. It's like a normal symptom of being human. And it can be... It can last for months. It can last for months. It, it can, can last be for years. Debilitating. Yeah. There's probably ways to break out of it much faster, including CBT and 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 uh, you know what the truth is medication. And like people don't want to hear this, but like 
the truth is it's a choice. Everything's a choice. You're choosing to be depressed. Yeah, for most people. Not for people who have maybe a chemical imbalance, but for most people, you're choosing it. Okay, let me, I'm gonna say what I think, which is I think obviously free will is a complicated subject and I think it's a bit of an illusion, but that doesn't obviate the fact that the voices that you listen to in your head that then provoke uh, feelings of depression and, and, and a loop, it is possible to intervene and choose differently. That's where choice happens, yeah. Yes, now what I will say is you are choiceless if you're not aware of that. So in other words, if you have no awareness that you have the ability to train your mind, to take medication, to be with a therapist, yeah. if, if you don't know that, you are gonna fall into a pattern of automatic behavior that is choiceless. Now, the thing is, once you know there's a possibility uh, to actually go, oh, okay, I'm, this is a terrible thought I'm having that I'm never gonna have a podcast that's as good as jo Joe Rogan's. That means I am- That's I'm, true. It is true. <laughs> Joe Rogan is a piece of shit, all right? I, I, the only way I'm gonna get even close to him is by bad-mouthing him constantly. No, he's amazing. Um, <laughs> if, if I start having negative thoughts about my ability in social media, I'll say, well, I'm not gonna reach people. I'm never gonna, we're never gonna encourage change. That means I'm a worthless piece of shit, which then makes me feel bad, which then encourages more thoughts. Well, you know, the other reason I'm a worthless piece of shit is this. Now, if I don't have the understanding that I can look at that thought for a second, step back from it and go, oh, that's interesting. Is there validity to that? Well, let me see, what cognitive distortions out of the list of 12 or 14 am I using? Uh, let me write them down. Uh, negative filtering, I see everything is negative. Dichotomous thinking, I'm either all good or all bad. Um, th there's a million of them. Like, sh should I thinking, which is, I should have done that, I should have yeah, done that, I yeah. should have done that, I did regret. Well, once you start to recognize those, then you can go, let's look at the situation as it is. Is that really true? Well, we have a pretty good movement going of passionate people who send these beautiful messages, which I filter out because I have negative filtering. All the positive messages that make me feel good in that moment, I discount and go, well, of course, they're just saying nice things. Yeah. Whereas in reality, what's happened is somebody's life has been changed. Somebody's vaccinated when they wouldn't have. Somebody has opened a book that they would never have bought. Somebody has looked at their job in a different way so that they now have compassion instead of empathy. They're not burning out. They have this endless reservoir of love for other human beings. That's a huge positive. So now I think, even now as I think about it, I'm like, I think we're doing okay, Tom Heinberg. If you didn't realize that that was something you could do, then you have no choice. But once you realize, then there is a choice. And then it is on you. Yeah. That's even, what I think. Even between that, though, like, you're, you'd have to associate, you have to be like, you know, whatever I do on social media, like, ultimately doesn't even, it's not tied to me. It doesn't even really matter. You know, and that gets to the sense of, oh, who is me? Right. So, you know, what's then it goes the self? deep. Then it goes then deeper. Then it goes deeper. deep. But yeah. what, do, everybody runs across awareness at some point. So it's not saying that like you're going to be trapped in it forever and there's no escape. There are no people that that happens to. Well, like unless you have severely diminished cognitive abilities in some regard, you know what I mean? Or you, ha or you have a mental, actually, a mental illness, you can get caught in a negative feedback loop, a real mental illness. Real, real, yeah, yeah, yeah. Serious, but yeah. for most people, you run into that brick wall of awareness at some point. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you run into it all the time. You're, you're obese because you ate your feelings and then all of a sudden you get on the scale and you're 400 pounds, you've never been 400 pounds before. That's telling you something, right? Yeah. Like, and this happens in all manner of ways. Yeah, well, and uh, this is an eternal discussion of how much of, uh, of our behavior is automatic and conditioned and genetic and uh, educational and how much of it is free choice. Now, what I think, and again, this is subtle nuance, but when I was talking to Hoffman about this, it opened my eyes to this idea. You know, if a human mind is a series of, like we have a high level awareness right now, you and I are aware of the room and we're right. aware of what's going on and we're aware of our thoughts arising. Okay, where are those thoughts coming from? Am I the author of my thoughts? Well, not really, they're arising from darkness. I'm seeing them and I'm deciding then at that point, I make a decision, Do I, I act, act on, on this, yeah. do I? Now there's the choice. What we, what we don't have choice on directly is what thoughts are arising and what what it, motivations are happening yeah. consciously. Now, if you, if you meditate or you do CBT or other things, you start to realize, oh, but there is a source for those thoughts. They are the sub-minds underneath that make up our mind as a whole. Those sub-minds each, in the theory that I think I'm a believer in, is they're each conscious agents made up of sub-minds. They condition 
free will, some minds above them, so in other words, our overall consciousness, right. and minds below them. So everything that we're exposed to, every thought we have at a high level conditions our sub-minds downwards and it constrains their free will choices. And if we can either do that in a good, positive way that improves suffering and, and well-being, or the opposite. Right. And listen, dude, like Buddhists and ancient Vedantic Hindus and others have been saying this shit for millennia, and some of them have been practicing it, and they're some of the happiest people you will ever meet. Why? Because they recognize thoughts as either being you know, wholesome or unwholesome, meaning mm -hmm. they're gonna improve my suffering or not other suffering or not. They're gonna fill me with love and kindness or they're not. And then make a choice in that moment. Well, that's what choice comes down to too, is like, you know, okay, yeah, y you had a shitty childhood or like, you don't know me, man. Like, it wasn't easy for me, man. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's yeah. like, yeah, 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 that's the past. Yeah. Right now we're now, ah. we're now. And choice happens going forward. So everything is, you know, you're 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 seeing the negative thought and the positive thought arrive. It's, it's your choice to go with the positive thought. Let me read you this thing by Jordan Peterson. He said, Consciousness is a mystery that faces the mystery of potential and turns it into actuality. We do that with every choice we make. Our choices determine the destiny, the destiny of reality. By making a choice, you alter the structure of reality. Yes. So you do always have that choice starting now, now right now, now, right now. And now you don't now. have the choice from the past. But let me, okay, so yeah. yes. And so let me elaborate on that in a way that reconciles this idea that we're victims of our past with we're authors of our future, which is from the beginning of when we're born, from the beginning of the Big Bang, really, causes and conditions have been set into motion that condition the next moment. So in other words, in the stream of reality, you know, like here I am in this moment and the next moment and the next moment, what happens in this moment creates a momentum that drives what happens in the next moment. They aren't unrelated. In other words, at no point do you have a hard reboot where you're like, I'm a brand new person that has no past conditioning and no momentum behind right. it. But that stream of momentum that causes and conditions that create reality in the moment we're in, by recognizing what it is and going, that's who I am right now. So who do I wanna be next? Well, here's my baggage. I'm gonna work hard on releasing the baggage and conditioning myself, reconditioning myself so that the next moment is more positive. That's what Jordan Peterson is really saying is we create reality, yes, but we're also easily caught up in the tide of consciousness as it's evolved from our birth if we don't recognize that, yeah, man, I was a victim when I was a kid of whatever, sexual abuse or physical abuse or financial abuse, and that conditioned me to behave a certain way, to have these chronic diseases and all these other things. So what do I do now? Yeah. Well, I'm a, in every new moment moving forward, I can change the path of that stream by starting to divert it, you know, with a rudder going in a different direction. But it involves knowing that I have that choice, knowing the nature of reality, and the fact that we are agents of choice in any given moment, and we're paralyzed by automatic behavior if we don't recognize that. Yeah. Yeah. Are we paralyzed or are we just locked in? Like, I mean, the, the, it's it's semantics, but... Paralysis, I think, refers to choice. So in other words, our choice is paralyzed if we don't realize that. But we're, yeah. we still continue as an entity. In other words, we will unfold as a creature that lives a life, has emotions, has relationships, does things, and dies automatically on autopilot there's, all our life. There's a real momentum to it, too, because you know if you choose to uh, live in denial, you will wither, and your ability to make choice will go away. And that can be self-imposed. Because you can run into one of these, like, I'm aware now, and then you say, I want to go back to sleep. You go right back into denial. So it's, I don't know that it's so clear cut as like, you were asleep and then you're awake. Oh, I agree. Right? There are very like, few stories where people just wake up. Yeah. It's more a slow enlightenment. Yes. You slowly, for me personally, it's been a process of seven years of being in Las Vegas. Yeah. Slowly waking up. And today I'm more awake than I was yesterday. And the more choices you make, uh, you know, it, it sort of begets choice, like it, it eats itself. You you feel more powerful making the next choice. So the, 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 there's a mind moment theory of consciousness where uh, it, consciousness isn't continuous, it's a series of discrete events. And kind of the basic neuroscience seems to back this up that, that any moment of awareness is a series of synchronized, you know, gamma and delta waves in the brain that that synchronize on a certain frequency. Without the synchronization, you can have sensory input, but it doesn't register in awareness. 
So I was just reading about this again, actually, because I thought it was fascinating, because the Buddhists talk about mind moments as he beads on a string where each moment uh, is, a, is like a bead of pearls on a string. Blockchain, and, yeah. It's like it's a, a blockchain. blockchain. And as it spins <laughs> through awareness, it creates a feeling like a movie where things are happening in real time. Right. And every like fourth mind moment is a binding moment that actually takes everything, every sensory piece, and puts it in one place and says, I'm in a room with Tom talking on a show. Whereas this raw sensory data in the mind moments it's is a zipper. Blue shirt. It's a zipper. It's like a zipper. Yeah. yeah, that's actually an interesting analogy. Well, so with each mind moment comes an intentionality component. In other words, a mind moment has input from the senses or the mind yeah. or whatever, and then it has a, a valence of what's the next mind moment gonna be? Yeah. And it turns out intentionality is what drives success in meditation. I'm intending to focus on the breath. It, just, it derives success in life. I am going to be better tomorrow about being diligent, about doing my taxes before the deadline. Yeah. And whatever it is, intentionality drives the next mind moment. Like you said, it's a momentum. Have you ever noticed, and maybe this is only true for me, but uh, I can only be truly happy in the past, in my memory. Mm. Because I look back and it's like, oh man, you remember when we did that thing and this and that? Because it's it's locked in amber. It's free from all of the anxiety of the present, like mm. of that next choice. Mm -hmm. You know, all the choices have been made and it's like a movie I can look back on. Hey, well, and then, but, but on the opposite of that is regret. Yeah. And depression. I, I should have done that. I can't believe. I have had sleepless nights where I sit in bed just thinking about some shit I said on a show or something I said to somebody or an interaction I had by email where I am so filled with regret that it's paralyzing. And, and the present moment would be free of that. This is why I always accept pain because pain is a fact of life. Like you're going to have to experience pain. I don't know that you necessarily have to experience regret, right? So you should suffer now to not regret later. Because if you ever see somebody who's you know, in the nursing home and they have regret in their eyes, you mm. can see it, it reeks off of them mm. and it's horrendous. Like it's, it hurts to be around them. Well, there was a famous Zen master in the US who had this formula, which is uh, suffering, S, equals pain, P, times resistance, R. Right. And resistance is saying, I don't accept what this pain is, or I'm concerned about it, or I regret something. Yeah. So when resistance goes to zero, when you accept everything, then P times zero is zero. So pain times zero is zero. So suffering equals zero. So pain is never optional. You're gonna have pain, but yeah. suffering is 100% optional. optional. Yeah. And I think regret is a big piece of that. Now you said you can never be present, you can never be uh, happy in the present moment. Truly uh, happy. Truly happy. I'm gonna say, and this just comes from recent experience in meditation and recent experience in waking life with screen-free Sundays and things like that. <laughs> Uh, I have, through practice, diligent practice, yeah. been able to focus so much on the present moment and let go, uh, relax, let go of resistance, that a, a sense of well-being and joy well up. And this is a real phenomenon, the meditators talk about it all the time, but it's so pervasive that you wanna stop whatever you're doing and go pick up the phone and be like, Tom, you fucking can't believe how happy I am right now. This is fucking amazing. <laughs> and then and then, then the future impinges, you start worrying or the past comes back or you get distracted, but it's real. And I think when you look at someone like Dalai Lama or one of these adepts, they live in that state oh, of yeah. bliss. I've been trying to get there. It's hard. Oh, you'll get there, yeah. It's yeah. hard. Uh, it's just, it's diligence. I'm still working on it all, every single day. This morning I meditated for an hour and five minutes and it was, not that I count, but I do. Well, for instance, I, like, okay, so I have a six week old at home, right? And like, she, you know, she's crying or like really severe crying, colicky the last few days. And it's, mm. you know, it's a nightmare to deal with Ooh. that. And so you're in this, like, it's, it's sort of a living hell because you haven't slept and like the, you can't calm this baby and you want nothing but to calm her down and you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm. But I find myself going, you know, okay, just wait it out. It'll be over. Wait it out. It's like, no, but man, this is my life. Like, and it's going to slip by one moment at a time if I keep thinking that way. Mm -hmm. If I keep being like, it'll be over. What am I going to do? Keep putting it off until I'm just dead? You know what I mean? No, no. This is what's happening now. This baby is crying her eyes out. And you know what? I'm so thankful that she's even here mm -hmm. in, the, in the world and that I get to be her father that... I don't care if she's crying. You know what I mean? Yes, it's painful, but I can sit with it and endure the feeling. 
rather than just trying to push forward to the next moment. Uh, and look how you did that. It gets back to closing the loop on this choice thing. You step back from your feelings, which are, oh God, yes, this kid. I lived along. I lived alongside with my feelings in that right, moment. My, right. It was like it was as though I had put my anger and my, or not anger, but my frustration, you know, here. And I'm, and me and frustration are both looking at the situation, and we're, and, I'm, and frustration's like, this sucks, man. We, what are we supposed to do? And I'm like over here, like you know, it, it's okay. It'll be, you know, we'll calm it down. And like, that, and, and, and that's what that's the secret. A lot of people get this wrong. They go, no, you want to squash the frustration. No, you make it go away. You have to. No, you you're there with yeah. it. Yeah, you accept it, but you don't become identified with it. And the, the great thing about the reality is, it's impermanent from second to second. Right. Five seconds later, that frustration may be gone. This is in the. In, in Buddhist scripture where Mara comes at Buddha with, uh, you know, swords and arrows and, and the Buddha just imagines them to be flowers and all of a sudden the, the environment changes, like, you know, the That's right. environment changes. And you can have the same sort of uh, thing happen on, on like a psychedelic drug. You can be having negative negative thoughts and, you know, if you're on a severe or a, uh, powerful psych psychedelic drug, you're seeing negative imagery associated with that because you're hallucinating, you're tripping your balls off, man. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. if you change your thought process, the imagery will go positive too. And it's like a physical embodiment of what they're talking about in uh, Buddhist scripture. It, 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 it's absolutely true. Yeah. Remember when we had Peter on the show, he was asking me if I'd ever had a transformative psychedelic experience. And I said, yeah, I've done psychedelics, but the transformative experience was high dose, heroic dose cannabis. Recently, uh, you know, and, and what it was, was there were two, one I talked about in that show, but the second was me trying to uh, understand the nature of how conscious awareness changes under the influence of THC and realizing that I was having these paranoid thoughts and these self-referential, like I'm a, not a very good person and mm -hmm. not very good at what I do. And you know, all the negative stuff that happens yeah. where people say, oh, I get real paranoid when I get high. That's me typically. But having done a lot of meditative training now, I was able to see that and go, oh, that's interesting. So it's a negative thought. Now, what if I just reframe this, just take a click over where everything, instead of being this, it's just, oh, I've amped up my perception of inadequacy high. So maybe I'll just switch it over and focus on positive stuff. Within a breath, I was just ecstatically, well, I had a sense of well-being. Right. And that all that negativity, I saw it just dissolve. And, and it's, it's, again, it's suffering, is pain times resistance. When you resist, when you're like, oh God, uh, you know, you're resisting, if you're resisting the child crying or the, this, what is, which is you have a beautiful kid that's there, that's having colic, it's the middle of the night, you haven't slept, you can resist it, but what will it accomplish you? Nothing. But suffering, yeah. yeah. But su just suffering. Right. Yeah. And, and I think part of the problem in, in America now, bring it back to healthcare as we approach an hour and three minutes, is we expect our suffering to be managed magically with pills and with interventions and surgical stuff and 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 social media is gonna help us and this yeah. and this. It's not how it works. It, it starts with us recognizing how reality is actually constructed and then acting in every moment to do our best to make it better. You know, another thing I would say about that too is our audience tends to be, you know, people who are highly responsible Right. Right. And they're not only responsible for themselves, but responsible for others. Right. And I think oftentimes the people that go into that um, sort of that take on that role willingly, hmm. they have a childhood trauma where they were made to feel like maybe they were worthless or whatever happened to them. And uh, so they take on responsibility in order to be worth something for other people. They're, they're basically hustling for their worthiness. Hmm. And I would say that if you are one of those people and you're listening to this, I, I am one of those people and uh, I have just given myself permission lately to be happy and to not have to feel like I have to make myself some weapon of ultimate you know responsibility and look out for all these people in order to be worth something but just just being here right now like I have self-worth I'm worth love I'm worth you know happiness I'm worth everything so that's what I would say to people you know that's uh, advice that I can't top uh, and I don't know how we got from anti-vaxxers to that, but that is our podcast in a nutshell. I think we were intending this podcast to be about lessons learned from turntable health and moving forward into 2019 and transforming healthcare, but we're just gonna have to shelve that for another time because we talk about what we wanna talk about 
because otherwise it's gonna be fake. Well, I think it's interesting because you know if you if you're hearing this, you're probably one of the people who you, you're either behind us on the journey or way ahead of us because we're just like muddling, muddying around in the middle. That's true. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we are in no way adepts at this journey. Right. So yeah. maybe it's inspiring if you're beneath us and if you're above us. You're like Jesus. These guys have a long way to go. <laughs> Exactly. And it's that level of humility, Tom Heinberg, that I think <laughs> separates us from the anti-vaxxers who always think they're right. And bringing that to a close, the calls to action are review this podcast on the podcast app. If you use Stitcher, we're based on SoundCloud as well. We're going to have a website. We have always a web post but, uh, where the video is going to be and where you can get links to become a supporter on Facebook, which really, really helps us in 2019. Um, also, email me guys on the podcast who don't watch the video, Zubin, Z-U-B-I-N at turntablehealth.com. I'll put it in the show notes because I want to hear your feedback. I love getting emails. I do. You would think that I don't because I get so many. Sometimes I can't respond, but I read every one and they're helpful to me. And it inspires me actually to continue doing what we're going to do in 2019, which is fuck shit up. <laughs> uh, woo woo, Logan. Woo. On that note, z Pack, I love you. Any parting words, Tom Heinover? We're coming for you, Dr. Oz. You're a bitch-ass bitch. I hate you so much, Tom Heinover. <laughs> and yet you are right. Peace out. Suck it, Oz! <laughs>